ורוח של ערבית על הגבעות משווה. ובמשעול ההר פסעו על מים האלה. מלחשים היו הם שיר של אהבה. ושיח דוקרני הוצת בלהבה. על אבן של דרכים ישבו על מה ואלם. מלחשים היו הם שיר של אהבה. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, we're gonna start the study. Okay, so welcome to this week's World Alliance of Karaim Torah study. Let me get rid of this banner. Let me reshare the screen. You guys know the routine about the screen. And there we go. Okay, so we are in Parashat Shlach. This is about the spies mostly. And we are in Numbers 13.1 through 15.41. So basically it's going to be Numbers 13, Numbers 14, and Numbers 15. So we have three chapters, and let's get to it. We're going to start in Numbers mm -hmm. 13. The Haftorah, the rabbinical Haftorah this week is also very interesting. It's the story of the... Uh, the uh, spies who come to spy out Jericho and encounter the prostitute Rahav, who lives in the wall of the city of Jericho. If we have time, get to that's one of my favorite stories in the Tanakh. I absolutely love it. And uh, yeah, we'll get to it if we can. Okay, so we are now in Numbers chapter 13, beginning in verse 1. So just to sum up, as we left, last left our heroes, who often do not act so heroically. Um, so we see that the Israelites finally, in, oh, where is it? In the 23rd day of the second month of the second year. So this means just after Pesach Shini, about a week after, no, about a day or so after Pesach Shini, um, the Israelites left, or actually arrived, at the desert of Paran. They finally left at the desert of Sinai here on the 20th of the second month of the second year. So if Pesach Shini would have been on the 15th month of the, uh, I'm sorry, 15th day of the second month, then we're talking about five days after that. There is a Pesach Sheni. We read about that last time, okay, in uh, Numbers something. <laughs> I can't remember. <laughs> One of the most recent chapters. And um, Numbers 11, I think. And uh, so, but there is no Hagamatzot Sheni. At least there doesn't seem to be. So the Israelites who were impure came with the question, uh, to Moshe, who then turned it over to God, to Yahweh, and uh, regarding what if they uh, cannot bring the Passover sacrifice on the 14th day of the first month because they are impure, and then God came back, Moshe came back with the answer from God, saying then uh, in order that you not be left out of the privilege of bringing the Passover sacrifice, the requirement of bringing the Passover sacrifice, you can bring it on the 14th day of the second month. That's known also colloquially as Pesach Shini. So you can bring the Passover sacrifice, but uh, it doesn't mention anything explicitly after that about uh, celebrating seven days of Chag Okay, It actually wouldn't even, I don't know, maybe it would make sense. Who knows? One could make an argument that since Chag naturally follows uh, the Passover offering, Right, the Passover offering is born on the 14th of the first month, Ben Arba'im, meaning in the evening as it's turning into the 15th month and 15th day. And uh, so, following that is uh, Hagamatzot. So, I guess one could logically try to make the argument that those who kept Pesach Sheni afterwards would kept, keep seven days of eating only unleavened bread. However, uh, I don't think that's the case because you could still eat the oven unleavened bread. Even if you're impure, right? You can't bring the Passover offering if you're impure on the on the fourteenth day of the first month, uh, because you can't bring an offering in a state of impurity. But you certainly can eat unleavened bread for seven days in a state of impurity, or if you're far away, right? Unleavened bread is super easy to make. <laughs> it's one of the easiest things in the world to make. Actually, you grab some flour, 
you grab some water, you can throw in a little salt, you can throw in a little spices. I know the carrots, the Egyptian carrots like to use coriander seed um, in memory of uh, the man, which said it tastes like zera, zera god or zera god, the a coriander seed. Uh, so they do that. However, it's real simple. You just basically knead the dough, flatten it out, put it in the oven. You don't have to wait for it to rise. You don't have to add any yeast. In fact, you can't add any yeast, and you shouldn't wait for it to rise for too long, even though it won't rise without a leavening agent. And you throw it in the oven, and if you did it right, uh, you will have some of the most delicious uh, homemade crackers you ever uh, tasted in your life. Absolutely delicious if done correctly. Uh, you can also, there are other styles you can do. Sometimes I do a tortilla style flatbread, just roll it out, pan fry it, not too long, because then it'll stiffen up and end up like a pompadon or something like that made out of uh, wheat. But if you cook it, almost undercook it, and then when you take it off of the pan, it will continue cooking on its own and it'll be nice and soft and flexible. And you can make yourself a nice, uh, nice uh, tortilla, completely, completely um, kosher on Chagamot. Okay, so that's that. Uh, anywho, so that was Pesach Sheni, I, but I digress, as I often do. So now we're going to be speaking about um, uh, the spies, right? The Parashat Miraglim, the incident of the spies. Uh, so I guess the good thing to say about that is uh, for one of the f first times in a long time, we're moving away from... You know, technical laws, Leviticus is, is difficult to go through. A lot of people can't stand reading through Leviticus because it's so technical. I absolutely happen to love it. It's fascinating to me, uh, the different materials that are used in the building of, I'm sorry, the, the, the Exodus, uh, the different sacrifices that have, the different types of sacrifices, the different types of animals that are brought, the meaning of, of each of the different sacrifices, the, uh, um, a bit of clothing, it's also an Exodus. I also love that part too. At any rate, but a lot of people like the story story time better. And here we are back at a little bit of story time. So here we go. So we are in Numbers chapter 13, verse 1, verses 1 and 2. And I will read in Hebrew. I'll comment where I feel I need to comment. Otherwise, my goal is to try to get through the Parsha since we'll do a study probably for about maybe two hours or so. Okay. Yahweh el Moshe lemor shalah lecha anashim. Yaturu et eretz kinaan asher ani noten livne is rael ish a hard ish a hard de mate le mate avotau tish lahu call the nasi bahem. Okay, so now we're going to God says to spy out the land basically, one person from each tribe, <coughs> and they should be the nasi among the tribes. Well, let's see if that's the case, right? We had a list of the Nasi Nisim at the beginning of Numbers. Let's see if that how that works out, all right? But Nasi doesn't necessarily mean the head of the tribe. Nasi comes from the underlying root Nose, which means to lift up. So it's an elevated one, basically a, a, a leader among the, the tribe, an elevated one, okay? Okay, so verse 3. Why Yishlach Otham? Moshe, Midbar Paran, Paran. So they're still in Midbar Paran. Remember, we said they had moved from, and here's our little list. Okay, uh, I can't remember why I put a question mark here, but ah, because it's a three days journey. So we know that they left finally the mountain of God, okay, the desert of Sinai, on, as we said, the 20th day of the second month of the second year. And it speaks about a three day journey before they arrived to the desert of Paran. So we can extrapolate from that that they arrived on the 23rd. They have the second month of the second uh, year, uh, about one, about two weeks, more or less, before the Hag Shavuot, Shavuot, the festival weeks, would occur. Okay, so here we are in the desert of Paran. So Moshe is sending the spies from the desert of Paran. Alpit Yahweh Kulam An Nashim Rashi Bnei Israel Hema. Okay, so they're all, um, uh, they're all heads. Of the children of Israel. Basically, again, they were the leaders among the tribes. Wa'ele Shimotam 
Limate Reuven Shamoa Ben Zachor. Okay, so let's have a little fun here. We had a list of the heads of the tribes in Numbers, beginning of Numbers. So here are the leaders of the tribes. Let's see if any of them are the same, and if so, how many. So from uh, Ruvain, we have Shamua ben Zahor. We're getting soaked to the Hebrew. So here we have the spies. Here we have the lists, the list of the, of the uh, leaders of the tribe. Okay, starting right here. Okay. So the Ruvain. The Ereshemot Anashim Asher Ya'amdu Itchem. So these are the princes of the tribe. So for Ruvain, we had the prince of the tribe was Elitzur ben Shadei Ur. But the spy that sent is Shamua ben Zahor. I don't know if he's mentioned anywhere else. Just out of curiosity, let's see if he pops up anywhere else. Uh, not in this context. Okay. There's other Shamuas, but I don't know the same. Okay, so here we have Shamu ben Zahor. So not the same. Namatesh Shimon. So we have Shafat ben Hori. Ben Hori. So he's the spy for Shimon. For Shimon here, the head of the tribe was Shlumiel. Shlamiel ben Tzuri Shaddai. By the way, also notice that really none of the names uh, include the name Yahweh, right? Like later on, we'll see Yirmiyah, Yirmiyah, Elisha, uh, Elisha doesn't like, uh, uh, Eliyah, or Eliyahu, etc. right? We have always Yah, or, Yah, or often Yah, Yahu, Netanyahu, for instance, that actually is the name in the Tanakh. Uh, but here, this is before people started naming themselves after the name of uh, God, because remember, they didn't even know, they weren't even, the name of Yahweh was not even revealed uh, in, until uh, it was told to Moshe on his way to, to Egypt. And believe it or not, we are already in Numbers 13, right? And the revelation of the name is in Exodus 3, right? Exodus 3? Yes. Exodus 3, and uh, so we've gone basically more than two whole books, and we've still only, in terms of uh, in terms of the time that's elapsed, we've only gone from uh, we said we're in we're in basically in the, sometime in the in the uh, second month of the of the second year, right? So this entire uh, uh, these entire books from Exodus, from the beginning of Exodus to now the middle of Numbers only spans a period of about two years. Well, these people are all adults. So that means that they were named when they were given names as children. This was before the the official, the eternal name of, of God, Yahweh, was given to, uh, to Moshe uh, and given to the Israelites. So these people do not have names that involve uh, uh, that involve that name, right? As the, as the later, uh, as later on, later Israelites do. They have names that often include El, El, uh, El, or Shaddai is very common, as we see here, right? So, just to point that out. Okay, so, Lamate uh, on Shafat bin Hori. So, that's the spy for Shimon. We said he's not the same as the leader of Shimon, who is Shlomiel, Shlomiel, which is, I believe, where you get the Yiddish word Shlomiel, Shlomiel, Shlomazel, Top and Pepper Incorporated, that one, that Shlomiel, right? Okay, so, um, oh, we have a comment. Shabbat Shalom, Yoshi Ben. So here we go. All right. So Lamate uh, Yehuda Kalev Ben Yefune, who I will not get into this now, but was probably not a convert, probably not a ger. Uh, <laughs> we can track this all down, uh, but I'm not getting into it now because we'll just uh, we will just get lost down a a uh, it will go down a rabbit hole. Okay, but. Uh, yeah, I won't get into it now. If we have time afterwards, maybe I can go back to it. But uh, Kalab bin Yifune is listed in Second Chronicles chapter 31, I believe it is, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe it's First Chronicles chapter 31. I'd have to look it up again. As being the son of Kenaz. Hence, he's called the Kenazi. It does not at all necessarily mean he's from the, the external nation uh, Kenaz, as the rabbis would claim. 
And there's no indication here that he is a ger, that he is a, a, uh, a convert, okay? Well, this is a problem for the rabbis because this is this is their this is their banner ger, this is their banner convert by uh, basically uh, assuming without proving and uh, promoting the idea that Kala ben Yifune was a ger, they are able to promote the idea that gerim can rise to the highest levels within within the nation of Israel. I don't see any indication of that whatsoever, right? Uh, we certainly know they can't be uh, kings because the Davidic dynasty, right, is promised eternal kingship. At least they can't be temporarily, uh, but they never were, at least not in First Temple period times. And uh, I don't see any any indication anywhere else that Gerim are able to rise to high levels within Israel. They certainly are part of the nation, uh, but they are basically, I hate to use the, the word, Second-class citizens. I'm hesitant to use it, but that's kind of essentially uh, what they are. There are a number of times where the gerim are counted in the book of Ezra. Is it Hamir Ezra? I believe Ezra. Also, it speaks about Solomon counting the gerim and in his uh, building of the temple and then using them for menial tasks. So the gerim are considered kind of the outer, outermost concentric circle, as I always like to say, of the nation of Israel. There's no indication, I don't believe that they can rise anywhere to the highest levels, the highest echelons of leadership within the children of Israel. And we certainly don't see this with Caleb ben Yefuna. It is just rabbinical propaganda uh, for them to say that Caleb ben Yefuna is a ger. And they have a, uh, a reason for doing that. They have an agenda in doing that. And their agenda is that they want to, they want to, to bring in outsiders into the nation of Israel. Uh, uh, because many of them themselves were, right? For instance, Rabbi Akiva, fam most famously, was a, was a ger, and he rose to the upper echelons. He was the, probably, you know, the quintessential rabbi of uh, Talmudic times, actually pre-Talmudic times. But, uh, at any rate, he lived around the time of Bar, Bar Kochba in the second century CE. Um, but uh, he was always touted as, you know, a, an example of how a ger can arrive to, arise to the highest heights of, of, of uh, the nation of Israel. I hate to be a party pooper, but I can only go by what the, what I believe the Torah says, and I'm happy if someone proved me wrong. I'm not doing this, you know, because uh, uh, because I have a a, a, a dog in this uh, in this race. But from my interpretation of the Torah, the Gerim are part of the nation, but they're the outermost concentric circle of the nation. They don't own land, at least not until the end of times, the end of days, which is uh, mentioned in the in the uh, prophets. And uh, they certainly, I don't see any indication anywhere that they can rise up to the highest echelons of the, the nation of Israel. And in fact, we know they're afforded special protections. They're afforded this, the protection of the Shabbat. Um, they're told not to be oppressed, right? Not to be, uh, uh, not to be uh, taken advantage of. And that's because they are, in a certain sense, the lowest echelons of the, of the uh, nation of Israel. So Caleb ben Yifuna, if we have time, we can go into it in detail. Uh, very likely, I would say, in my opinion, for certain, was was not a ger, that he was a an Israelite from the tribe of Yehuda, from the clan of Kenaz. His father was named Kenaz. Okay, so at any rate, here we go. Uh, so verse 7, let's do highlight 7, 8, and 9. Lemate Yisachar Yiv'al ben Yosef. So Yigal ben Yosef Yisachar Lefraim Hoshea ben Bin Nun. We've heard of this guy before. That's our that's our Joshua. Le Mate bin Yamin Pati ben La Rafu. Okay, so who do we have in numbers one? Uh, so for Yisachar, Nitanel ben Suar, different guy, Ephraim. Now it changes the order. Levni Yosef, Lefraim, Elishama ben Amihud is the is the head. So so far, all of them are different, right? Le me le Binyamin Pati ben Rafu. Where's our Binyamin here? Binyamin Avidan ben Gidoni is the head of the tribe. So the spies are important, right? The Nisiim, right? Nasi is an, again is elevated, literally a one who's lifted up, whose head is lifted up, or who's lifted up an elevated one within the within the. Uh, within the uh, tribe, a leader within the tribe, but we see it's not the same as the uh, as the Nisi'im, 
or as the uh, heads of the, of the tribes that are listed, the princes of the tribes that are listed in, uh, in Numbers chapter 1. Let me just see something here. Okay, so... Um, Matthes Volun, Gadiel ben Sodi. Okay, Sodi again, Sod is my counsel. In modern Hebrew, Sod is a secret, but really it means counsel, right? Who will enter into the counsel of Yahweh, right? So Sod is, is like God's counsel, right? So it's interesting. Again, these names all relate to, to God, but they don't use, again, uh, Yah, Yahu, right? Which we'll see in later Hebrew uh, names. Okay. Where were we? So that's is the Vulun. Is the Vulun here? He's not the same guy. Let's Vulun go. Come here, Zvulun. Dan, Asher Legad, the Naftali. This is Vulun. Masha, Le Binyamin, Le Dan. It's not the same guy. I can't say. Okay, Lemate Yosef, Lemate Menashe, Gadi Ben Susi. Uh, my sister's married name is actually Susi, believe it or not. So there you go. Uh, Gadi Ben Susi. And here for Menashe, we have. Gamliel Ben Pidah Tzur. So, okay, let's leave it at that. We see it's not the same. The point is that the spies are important people within the within the tribe, but they're not the same ones as are named as the head of the tribes in Numbers chapter 1. Lamate Dan, Amiel ben Gimali. My camel. No, I don't think it means that. Gamal means to return kindness. Lamate Asher. Satur ben Michael, that's my English name, Michael, Michael. In the United States, when we're born Jewish, we get an English name and we get a Hebrew name. My English name is Michael. My Hebrew name is Melech. This was a name given to me by my parents, named after my great-grandmother, Malka. So some people have accused me in the past of choosing the name Melech because I uh, maybe think I'm the Mashiach or something like that. This could not be farther from the truth. I do not think such a thing. And uh, my Hebrew name Melech is based on my great grandmother's name Malka. That's my uh, my uh, my mother's mother's mother is Malka. Okay. Lamate Naftali Nahbi Ben Ben Vafsi Vafsi. Okay. Lamate God Giuel Ben Machi. So here we have um, uh, Moshe is is uh, renaming Hoshea uh, as Yehoshua. So here it's interesting. Now if we look at this, this is actually very very interesting. Okay, so Hoshea is being renamed by Moshe Yehoshua ostensibly at this time, right, before he sent in, into, uh, into Israel to spy out the land. And what do we say? We saw the names that, that the the, uh, the names uh, did not contain Yah in them, right? But here Moshe is changing the name of Hoshea, right, which means basically Hoshea basically comes from the the, uh, the underlying Hebrew root Yasha, which means uh, to save or to, uh, what's the word? Save to uh, I can't salvation to save basically right. It's the same where the, the Christians well, the same reason the call, Christians called uh, Jesus uh, 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 Yeshua or Yeshua right it comes from that same root right. And uh, I actually was re watching an interesting lecture uh, by a uh, a lecturer who I highly recommend named Robert Eisenman. An expert on the on the Dead Sea Scrolls, and he claims that the that uh, Yeshua or Jesus was really not the true name of that guy, okay, of uh, of the person that later became the idol of the uh, Christians. He claims that that was just he was he uh, he either called himself or others called him uh, either while he was alive or or posthumously they called him uh, Yeshua or Yeshua, 
because they thought of him as the savior, because in their eyes he was the savior, and that was not his real name. At any rate, I digress. I will list the name of this guy if you want to watch some really, really, really interesting lectures by a very, very independent thinker, then, then you can look up this guy. So here we go. I'll just list his Wikipedia page. I'll post his Wikipedia page, and then you can follow along. He's got a bunch of stuff on YouTube. I've thoroughly, thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed listening to him. Uh, he basically speaks a lot about the uh, about the Dead Sea Scrolls, about the Second Temple period, specifically about the the uh, the rise of uh, of Christianity. And he's a very interesting idea that that the uh, that the uh, <coughs> sect that wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, were basically uh, messianic Sadducees. I don't want to misquote him because his his, uh, his uh, ideas are a lot are more nuanced than that. But basically, he says I don't think he says explicitly that the Dead Sea sect were followers of uh, Jesus, but that they were in that same kind of mindset. That it was a, that it was a time where they that uh, first of all, it's clear from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Not that I'm an expert in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Maybe someday I'll try to get a lot more into them. But I certainly don't claim to be an expert in the Dead Sea Scrolls. But it's clear from the Dead Sea Scrolls, as far as I understand, uh, that uh, basically they were kind of a radical uh, messianic movement. Messianic not in the sense of following uh, Jesus of Nazareth. Messianic in the sense of they were expecting the end of times to come very soon and kind of actively waiting for it and preparing for it. So um, so he says that... that uh, that that's the same kind of, uh, shall we say, mindset out of which grew uh, Jesus of Nazareth and his uh, and his uh, followers. And he basically, uh, as far as I understand, uh, also claims that there's a there's a, a possibility that the Dead Sea sect uh, they were basically Sadducees uh, who were who were uh, fed up fed up with the uh, the uh, the mainstream Sadducees back in Jerusalem siding too much with the uh, with the ruling elite, with the ruling Roman elite, and uh, uh, which Josephus points out, right? He says that they they were known as elitists, and so they kind of went off into the desert, uh, stuck with their loyalty to to the uh, you know to the uh, to the temple cult, the temple of Yahweh cult, meaning our cult that's mentioned in in the book of Leviticus and elsewhere. And um, uh, uh, but kind of rebelled against the the mainstream Sadducees that were back in, in Jerusalem and had uh, and had uh, and had seemingly uh, gone too far in the direction of of Hellenism and uh, siding with the uh, siding with the ruling Greek slash Roman authorities. I guess really in the time of the Romans, so the Roman authorities. Anyway, stuff is amazing. Watch some of his lectures on YouTube. Robert Eisenman can't recommend it enough. How do we get into this? I have no idea. So let's get back to what we're doing. Ah, yes, I was mentioning Yeshua, that now Moshe renames Yeshua, I'm sorry, Hoshea, not Yeshua, renames Hoshea bin Nun as Yehoshua bin Nun. But what did we just say? We said that most of the names, of all of the names of the people we're seeing, you don't see Yah or Yahu as you would in the, in the, uh, in the, the uh, later figures you'll see in the, in the, in the Tanakh, like Yerim Yahu, Yerim Yah, Yerim Yahu, Eliyah, Eliyahu. Etc. A million other examples because the name was not known when these people were born. Well, what does Moshe do? He renames Hosea as Yehoshua, right? So he get, he gets in that Yahu, right? He he incorporates the name of God that had just been revealed to him a little over two years ago, uh, not two years ago, two years previous to when he's doing this, right? Not much more than that. Certainly, not much more than that. And uh, as we mentioned in Exodus 3, when the name of, of Yahweh is revealed officially to Moshe on his way back to Egypt, or actually when, he, uh, when he's in, in, uh, 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 at, uh, uh, in the burning bush incident, or is it afterwards? No, 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 I think it is at the burning bush incident. And uh, so at any rate, so, um, so now Hoshea is, is renamed to incorporate, to incorporate the, the name of Yahweh. Right as Yehoshua. Now, if you want to see an excellent series on, I for many years called the name of God Yahweh. I'm sorry, Yehoah, based on uh, the research of a certain Karite who has, uh, you know, who has uh, gone a little bit off the deep end. At any rate, uh, 
I will now recommend a video series which I have, uh, which has changed my opinion. And so now I call, I say the name of God is Yahweh, and I have to find it. This guy is a Christian, actually a messianic, but his ideas are not based at all. I won't say at all, but 99% of his ideas have nothing to do with his his uh, being a messianic. He basically does a uh, uh, an a he, an analysis of the uh, the Hebrew manuscripts of the Tanakh and also of biblical Hebrew grammar. And he's the guy's absolutely brilliant Hebrew scholar, and he uh, makes a very very strong case for the pronunciation being Yahweh and not Yahweh. In fact, he he uh, um, he even kind of makes a fool out of the person who is going around telling everyone that the name of 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 God is pronounced Yahweh. So since then I've switched over Yahweh. Let me find this guy. His name is well, what's the, what's the channel again? Christian Gospels? No, Hebrew Gospels, right? Hebrew Gospels. There we go. So if you look at this playlist here. It's going to really open your eyes very uh, in detail. It's very technical. Uh, you don't have to watch the whole thing. It's a 15 part series. Here it is called Pronunciation of the Tetragrammaton of Yahweh. And uh, he really, really is an excellent, excellent Hebrew scholar. I must say, young guy, he's probably in his 20s, maybe around 30 at the most. And he really, really makes a, a very sh strong case. So uh, let's see if I can share the first video here copy i'll paste it over here and again ignore the fact that he happens to be a messianic it's not relevant to 99.9 .9 of his arguments his arguments again are based on on biblical hebrew and on biblical hebrew manuscripts such as the aleppo codex the leningrad codex etc okay okay so that's that um right Radio. So where were we? We were here. So Yeshua is Hoshea is renamed Yahoshua to incorporate the name of Yahweh into the name Yeshua. Okay. All right. Introduction. Instructions to the spies. <clears throat> we're in verse 17. Numbers chapter 13, verse 17. What? Yishlah Utham Moshe Latur et Retzkinaan. Wayomer Alehem Alu Ze Ba Nerev. We are Alitem et Pahar. Okay. Uritem et Haaretz Mahi Wa et Haam Hayoshev Oleha He Hazak Hu Ha Rafe Hamiat Hu Im Rav. So he tells them to go, basically go up Aluzeba Negev, go up through the uh, Negev, which could just mean the desert, or maybe it's referring specifically to the, the uh, Negev desert. Uh, I'd have to look at some of the commentaries to see. And go up to Alitam Etahar. I think that's just referring to the hill country. It's probably translated as. Let's just get a translation for that. So this is Numbers 13, 17. We'll just get a quick Robert Alter translation on that one. Yeah, so go up this way through the Negev. So he's treating that as a uh, proper noun, meaning the Negev desert, down in the area of Beth Sheva, and you go up into the high country. So he translates that as a high country, okay, or hill country. So he, he uh, is agreeing with that translation. Okay, so um, and the hill country is what? That's the that's the uh, what that's referring to is the uh, uh, basically the mountains of uh, of uh, Judea and perhaps uh, Samaria as well, right? That's what the hill country means, the central part of Israel that today is is hilly, including Jerusalem, which is which is in the hills of Judea, the Judean hills. Um, okay, Oreitem et haaretz ma he oh we said this. Okay, so check them out. Are they strong? Are they weak? What's the story with the people that live there? What's the story with the land? Okay. Uma ha'aretz asher hu yoshev ba. 
התגובה היא אם רעה אומה האורים אשר הוא יושב בהנה במחנים אם במבצרים So check out the cities, okay? Are they in Mahanim? That means basically in the open field. Uh, here it translates it as like camps or Mitzarim. Mitzarim are, are uh, strongholds, okay? Okay, verse 20. Umah ha'aretz hashmina hi im raza היש בעץ עם עין, והית חזקתם ולקחתם מפרי הארץ ויעמים ימי מקורי ענבים. So go there, check out, is, is it that literally is the land fat or is it skinny, but does it mean does it produce a lot of produce, is it fertile, or is it, uh, or is it uh, fallow, right? Um, and היית חזקתם, be strong or strengthen yourselves, take back samples of the of the fruit of the land so this was in the time of the first fruits of the grape harvest okay so we can get also a kind of a time stamp on that the first ripe grapes okay well we know that the last time that we had mentioned if i'm not mistaken again was the 23rd of the second month of the second year. So 23rd of the second month uh, when they arrived in the desert of Paran. So that is going to be before the grape harvest is ready. The grape harvest, the first fruits of the grape, har grape harvest are maybe going to be June, July. Let's go July 1st, right around now. Maybe start getting the first fruits of the grape harvest. Maybe a little bit later, I guess, depending on where. But maybe the first fruits would be, we'll just go with July, uh, more or less. So then that would place us in more or less the, oh, let's see. Where are we right now? I think we're just about to get, well, the new moon is in about a week. And that is going to be the fourth month, right? So about the beginning of the fourth month or so. So uh, again, It's a rough estimate. We don't have any specific dates here, but let's say about a, a month after or a month and a half after they arrived at the, at the uh, desert of Paran, right? They arrived on the 23rd of the second month, and we're talking maybe the first of the fourth month. Again, that's just total speculation. <coughs> we're just trying to give it some kind of timestamp just to get it uh, to uh, um, locate it in, in, in time and space. Okay, so there we go. Verse 21. ויעלו ויתורו את הארץ ממדבר סין עד הרחוב לבו חמת חמות. ויעלו בנרב ויבו עד חברון ושם אחימן שישי ותלמי ילידי הענק. וחברון שבע שנים נבנתה לפני, לפני So on Misraim. Okay, well, here we get some interesting information. So they, they went up from the desert of Tzin. The desert of Tzin is mentioned, I believe. Well, that's the desert of Tzin. Not the desert of Tzin. Right, it's not mentioned. So this desert of Tzin is new. Oops. Let me get rid of this. So this desert of Tzin. Uh, so they went up through the Negev desert and they Yavo Hevron and they came to Hevron. Okay, so here we are back at Hevron. Hevron, we already know, has a has a uh, has a rich history, right? We know that already um the the patriarchs, including uh Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are buried there. It's spoken about in the book of uh of uh, Genesis. And uh, we know that uh, the matriarchs, uh, Sarah and uh, Rivka and Leah, are buried there. Uh, Rachel is buried in Kever Rachel on the way to Ephrat, which may or may not be what they call Kever Rachel today. It's probably not, but who knows. Uh, so here we are back at Hebron, right? 
Hebron is also the city uh, where David was first crowned king. I shouldn't say where he, crowned king, where he was crowned king, where he first ruled for seven years uh, over Judah before he ruled over all of Israel after uh, conquering Mitzudat Zion, the stronghold of Zion, and uh, moving his uh, his kingship to Jerusalem. Okay, at any rate, Hisham Ahiman, Shishai, Talmi, Yalideh Anak. So now we have these three guys, Ahiman, Shishai, and Talmi, uh, who were uh, the descendants of the Anak, of the giants, Hebron, Shevashanim, Nibnatal, Ifnit, Tzohan, Mitzrayim. And when was the city Hebron built? Uh, seven years before Tzohan of Egypt. Okay, so a lot of stuff for the archaeologists, the biblical archaeologists and historians to go crazy with. Uh, let's just check in on Robert Alter and see what he has to say about this. Eleven sixty six. One second. So let's get a little bit of commentary. Okay, so Anak is understood by some of the modern translations to be an ethnic designation, the Anakites. So not as uh, giants, but he himself translates it as offsprings of the giant. Okay, the words of the scouts, however, in verse 33, clearly place offspring of the Anak in apposition with Nephilim, the legendary man-god hybrids mentioned in Genesis 6, 1 through 4, and there's no indication elsewhere of an ethnic group called... <coughs> Anakites. On the basis of this chapter, Anak in all subsequent Hebrew in all subsequent strata of Hebrew is the standard term for giant. The legendary scale of the bounty of the land, its fatness is matched by the legendary proportion of its inhabitants. It should be noted that this representation of Hebron inhabited by giants swerves from the depiction of Hebron in Genesis 25, where the local citizens were ordinary and commercially shrewd Hittites. Okay. Zoan, Egypt, so this uh, city is usually identified as Thomas wherever that is. Okay. So, we'll let the biblical archaeologists go crazy with that, but we will go on to the next verse. Why yashuv mitur ha'aretz mukets arba'im yom wa yilchu wa yavu el Moshe wa el Aharon wa el kol adat b'nei Yisrael el mid bar par'an so first of all, I just want to add to my little list of places here that um, in Numbers 13.25 in Numbers... 1825. Uh, Israelites are said to be in Kaddish. Okay, Kaddisha. So this is the the hay at the end is not part of the name. The hay at the end is the is the uh, the movement towards <coughs> um, particle. So I had a friend uh, when uh, when I used to visit back in uh, in New York, and uh, he always used to say uh, that uh, if he was returning from Manhattan to Queens, he would always say to me, "I ani choser Queensa towards Queens or to Queens." So at any rate, same thing here. So they're in Kadesh, and. Uh, I'm just going to mention that. So this is in the desert of Paran. Ready. So there we go. 
All righty. Um, why is she with Tom? Tom Davar. Why it called Ha Eda? What Yarum it pre Haaretz? So they brought back word of the land. They brought back fruits. Why is Sabru Lo? Why Yomru Banu El Haaretz Asher Shilach Tanu Ram Zava. Halav Udvash he was it Piria. So they say it is indeed a land flowing with milk and honey. You can follow along in the English if you want. I'm not going to do full translations. Uh, and here's some of its fruit. Here's a sample. Okay. Ephes, that's a strange word, kind of hard to translate. You translate is therefore, or nevertheless, nevertheless. <coughs> Ki az ha'am ha'yushay but nevertheless the the people who sit in the who dwell in the land are strong. Wa ha'arim bitzurot and the cities are are built up are fortified gidolot. Um, they are big and fortified cities, very big and fortified cities. Ram yilade ha'anak orainu sham, and we also saw the offspring of the giants there, as was mentioned in Hebron. Amalek, Yosheb Aretz Ha Ne Rev, We Haiti, We Hayibufsi, We Ha Emori, Yosheb Bahar, We Ha Kinahani, Yosheb Al Hayam, We Al Yad Hayardin. So all of these different nations are sitting in the land, right? The Amalekites, uh, the Hittites, the Jebusites, who are the owners of Jerusalem when David conquers it, eh, Emori. The Amorites, the Canaanites, etc. Okay, so the giants are there. They're strong and fortified cities. All of these different nations are sitting there. So not good. Okay. So we ya has kolev in haam el Moshe we yomer orlo na ale. We yar y rashenu yarashnu y ra I'm sorry we yarshnu ota ki yachol nuchal la la okay and Kalev ben Yefune again uh, we saw that Kalev ben Yefune was mentioned as the head or the spy that was sent from the tribe of Yehuda okay right there. 13.6, in verse 6. So Kalev ben Yehuda tries to calm things down, tries to <coughs> calm the people down, and says, uh, we can go up, or let us go up. We can certainly go up, or let us certainly go up. Uh, we can we can, we can, can take it over, we can inherit it, uh, because we're capable of this. We, we have the power to do this, okay? So Kalev ben Yehuda, is of a different heart, as we know, and as we shall see in more detail. And the other people, the other spies said, no, we can't do it. These people are too strong. We're not going to be able to, to go up to the land. We're not going to be able to take over the land. And they spread a bad word, or they, they spoke... Uh, badly about the land, right? They they said had bad things to say about the land. The Sher Paru Ota, which they had uh, uh, toured through or had uh, scouted out. El Bene Israel Emor Haaretz Sher Avarnu Ba Latur Ota Eretz Ocheret Yoshveha. It's a land that devours its inhabitants. So they're really speaking out about the land. Okay, he Chola Amasher Ra'inu B'Tocha and She Midot, and everyone we saw there are are. Literally, uh, uh, people of size, they're large, right? Or perhaps strong, or perhaps both. Okay, so there we saw the, uh, so here we have an interesting statement. Nifilim bne anak. Okay. The Nephilim, right? We know of the Nephilim back in, again, that was Exodus 6. Uh, 
I'm sorry, I didn't mean Exodus 6. Genesis 6, right? That's what the Nephilim are mentioned. Okay. Um, so these are the Nephilim B'nai Anak. So the, they are, uh, well, there are a number of way, different ways to translate this, but basically the, the Nephilim, uh, who are very large or who are the children of the giants, Minha uh, Nephilim. So let's see how Robert Alter deals with that one. And there we did see the Nephilim, sons of the giant from the Nephilim. So I don't get that either. We were in the sons of the giant from the Nephilim. I don't know. We'd have to figure out exactly what that's trying to say. At any rate, the Nephilim, as Robert Alter did point out, are put in parallel with the with the uh, Anak, right? So therefore, Anak means the giants. And Nephilim, we know, are again these these uh, these giants mentioned back in Genesis six that uh, uh, the uh, sons of God saw that the daughters of man were beautiful and so they uh they they uh went to them right and uh well who knows what that is there's a million and one speculations we're certainly not going to get into that now so uh we were in our eyes as grasshoppers right we, we seem the smallest grasshoppers ourselves and the same in their eyes right so to, to us and to them i guess they were noticed as as spies, I don't know if they knew what they were doing there, but I guess in their eyes also they saw these Israelites and they were like grasshoppers. So basically, uh, the, the spies come back and they basically say, "Listen, uh, we can't do this. Okay, there's too many people there. They're too strong. The cities are too fortified. There are giants there. You know, lions and tigers and bears. Oh my, right? We can't do this." Okay, well we all know the story, so no need to dwell on it. All right, so that's not good. So verse one, what is that called? It kolam wa ifhu haam belayla hahu. So the entire nation starts complaining and whining, as we Jews are so uh, good at. That seems to sometimes to be our our expertise. So now they complained to Moshe and to Aaron and uh, and uh, in their finest Am uh, Oref in their finest uh, 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 stiff neck nation form they say uh if we should have died in egypt or we should have died in the desert right it would have been better to die in egypt or in the desert right than to go up and get swallowed up by these giants and basically they're they're scared out of their out of their uh their pantaloons okay and uh so these 10 spies uh except for Caleb ben yufuna and yeshua ben nun the only ones who give a good report these 10 spies really kind of like uh sucked the the uh the wind out of the, out of the nation, and those ten spies will certainly get their punishment. Okay. And why is Yahweh bringing us to this land uh, only to fall by the sword for us and our women and our children to fall by the sword? And to be as spoils, in other words, to be taken as, as uh, slaves or killed. Maybe it's better for us, or maybe it would have been better for us to return to Egypt. So, and, and the nation said, let's get rid of this Moshe fellow. We're going to appoint another leader and go back to Egypt. Okay, so now they're, as we said, maybe two years and three months out of Egypt, and now that's like, okay, let's go back. Okay, so that's not good. Certainly is showing no faith in God, right, after all that God did for them. God brought them out of Egypt. God protected them against the Egyptians. God gave them the, the, man, the mana. God led them through the desert, right, gave them the Ten Commandments, appeared to them, 
uh, in, in person, so to speak, right, with his own voice. <clears throat> and now the nation already so quickly has forgotten all that and uh, and uh, is, uh, is uh, ready to ditch God and ditch Moshe and ditch everything and just go back to Egypt to basically undo everything that, uh, that Yahweh has done for them. Okay. So Moshe and Aaron fell upon their faces before all of the the congregation of the uh, um, of the well, the I don't know congregation assembly of the congregation. There we go. Bnei Israel. So now Caleb and uh, Joshua tear their clothes. That's a that's a common uh, sign of mourning or of despair. Uh, mentioned many 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 times throughout the Tanakh. Oyomru el kol adat bnei Israel, and I said to all of the of the congregation of Israel, so they say the the land that we spied out, that we we uh, scouted out, is very very good, right? Okay, so it's kind of like triple emphasis: tova, not just good; tova meod, not just very good; tova meod meod. Okay, very very good, right? So they're really emphasizing. Uh, the fact and repetition, as we've said many times in the in biblical Hebrew, means emphasis. So here we have uh, kind of a triple emphasis, one could say. Okay, would have been enough just to say tova haaretz, but they said meod meod. Okay. Im hafetz manu Yahweh wahivi utanu el haaretz azot we nitat we nitat we nitana. Lano eretz asher he zabat halav udavash. Okay, so if God if God is on our side, if he's if he so desires, um, or if he uh, takes a liking to us, or or hafetz uh, banu Yahweh, if he loves us basically or desires us, uh, then he can bring it, us into this land and he can give us the land. Okay, no problem. We can do anything if we have God on, on our side. Okay. And again, they emphasize it's a land flowing with milk and honey. Zavat halav adibash. Nine. Ach b'yahweh al timrodu ve'atem al tira'u et am ha'aretz ki l'hameinu hem sar zilam mi'alehem ve'yahweh itanu al tira'um. Okay, so then... Uh, don't rebel against God, he's saying. So uh, they're saying, okay. Uh, and don't people of the land, they're, they are bread. They are our, our, our food, our feast. We'll feast on them. Maybe would be a good way to translate that. Let's see how Robert Alder deals with that one. Verse 9. For they are our bread. Sar okay. Silam, so Tzil is a shade, so their shadow, their shade, their protection, right? Shade, a shadow is often uh, um, used as a uh, metaphor for protection, right? So they're exposed now, their the shade which which protected them from the harsh sun has been taken away from them. So, and Yahweh is with us, will be with us, do not fear them. Verse 10. Uh, so how did the nation respond to this encouragement? One second, I just want to see one thing. Right, so they responded by wanting to stone these two to death. <laughs> so... So much for that inspiring speech. It didn't really work out too well. Okay. And now God gets involved. So he appears at the Ohel Mo'ed. 
which at this point is the Oher Mo'ed, is the tabernacle, right? The Oher Mo'ed is the tabernacle. So the glory of Yahweh appeared at the Oher Mo'ed. The tabernacle was already built, right? Um, it was moved when the Israelites moved from the, uh, it said explicitly that it was moved when they moved from the desert of Sinai to the desert of Paran, which just recently happened. We already know it was built. It was dedicated. The, the Levites were already installed. Etc. So here we go. So now when it mentions the Ohel Mo'ed, um, it's always referring to the tabernacle. Verse 11. Why you mer Yahweh and Moshe Ad? Anna, ye na'atsuni, ha'am hazeh, wa ad anna lo ya'aminu bi. Behol ha thought asher asiti, mikirbo. So God is basically saying, how long are these people going to going to continue to infuriate me and how long are they going to refuse to, or are they going to continue to not believe in me after all of these signs that I did for them uh, so then uh, God comes up with a new plan just as he destroyed all of humanity in the time of uh, Noah, except for Noah and his immediate family. So, Akenu, uh, I will strike them down with a plague, and I will the Orishenu, and uh, uh, and basically I will disinherit them. I will disown them. I guess would be a good way to translate that. Let's see how Robert Alter deals with that one. Dispossess them. I like disown better, but okay, that works. Right, and I'm going to make you into a great nation, uh, a, 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 a great and more powerful nation than them. Okay, so that's what he says to Moshe. We get rid of these people, we'll start all over again with you. Okay, and Moshe responds. Isn't it easy to get through the story parts of the of the Torah, right? When when we're going through the building of the tabernacle, when we're going through the, the Levitical laws, it was, it was really, really technical. I mean, I love it. I, I really love it. It's, it's uh, good stuff, but it's uh, it's 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 kind of a slow go. You have to really, really, really uh, kind of pay attention. It helps to make charts and and, uh, and diagrams and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, we're just you know reading reading uh, an interesting story, right? Okay, verse thirteen. Moshe <laughs> We amru el yushev haaretz hazot sham shamu aki ata Yahweh bekerav am hazet asher ein ba'ein nira ata Yahweh we we anon ha omed alehem ube amud anan. So this is what Moshe responds to God uh, that uh, Egypt is going to hear. It's verse 13. Um, that you brought this nation out of, you used your strength to bring this nation out of, out of Egypt. Amru el Yosheva Aretz, and they're going to they're going to say to the inhabitants of the land, meaning the land of Canaan, uh, uh, that they heard that you God are among these people. Basically, you're among these people. You appear to them face to face or eye to eye, and you appear in the in the in the cloud and in the fire. We'll go on to verse fifteen. We. And if you kill off these people all at once, then um, the nations, the Goyim, uh, who have heard about your fame, have heard about your name, right? Have heard about your reputation. Um, what are they going to say? They're gonna. What are they gonna say? It was because Yahweh was unable to bring the, this uh, this nation, this people, 
uh, to the land which he swore to them uh, that he killed them, that he uh, slaughtered them in the desert. That's what they're going to say. In other words, if you kill off these people, so Moshe is making a a, a very kind of a appealing to to God's to Yahweh's uh, a sense of uh, of uh, of uh, shall we say honor, right? He's appearing, appealing to his emotions in a certain sense, right? If you kill these people off in the desert, what are the nations are going to say? The nations are going to say that you did this because you were unable to bring them up into the land that you promised, right? It's going to make you look bad, okay? We are more. Yahweh, Morad, Hasid. So now, so now, please be strong. In other words, is what Moshe is saying. Okay, as and and fulfill what you spoke. You said right. Yahweh uh, erech that that. That you Yahweh are erech paim. That's usually translated as um, how do you translate that to English again? Erech paim is uh, long suffering. Okay, literally it means <coughs> uh, long in the nose, but figuratively what it means is you is uh, is you wait a long time before fire comes out of your nose. Right? There's this this is hari af. This idea of a, of a fire coming out of one's nose, that's a, a figurative way that the Tanakh speaks about someone getting anger. So erech ha'paim means it's a long time before fire comes out of your nose. It's a long time before you get actually translated as long suffering. Okay, you, you don't get angry very easily. You have a lot of patience before you get really, really pissed off at people. What I've said, and full of kindness, no se avun, what pasha, and, and uh, you bear, you forgive, you bear uh, sin and uh, transgression. Nake lo yinake, that's what you translate as you, but you do not completely absolve someone of their sins. Okay, avon avot albanim, you visit, where you, you punish the uh, the uh, the sins of the fathers upon the, the, uh, upon the children until the third, until the fourth generation. Okay, so this is a quote from uh, So let's see if we can find yeah, the Ah, uh, So this is originally, so what Moshe is doing is he's quoting Shemot Lama Dalet, Shemot Exodus 34, 6. Okay, so let's take a look at Exodus 34, 6 for a second. Well, where's Lavi? Okay. So Exodus 34, 6. Oops. So just to make it go quick, let's just look at the English for a second. I'm going to look at the NIV translation. So this is Moses getting the second uh, tablets after he broke the first one when he saw the golden calf, right? So 
So this is this is the original phrase, okay? So I'll just read the English to get through quickly. So Yahweh, Yahweh, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, uh, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents, the third and fourth generation. So this is Yahweh. This is God making a declaration about himself. And so what is Moshe doing here? See, Moshe's arguments is, is brilliant. In fact, oops. In fact, all the time that the, the patriarchs make arguments to God, they're kind of brilliant arguments, right? We'll talk about that in one second, but let me get back to this. Right? So he's throwing this back in his face. God, you said, you said yourself, this is what you are. You're long-suffering. You forgive sin. You don't get angry easily, etc. And now you're going to do this? Okay, you're a hypocrite. He's basically calling God a hypocrite. Well, maybe not quite that way, but he's reminding God. He's throwing God's words back into his, his, his own proverbial face, right? So he's using a number of arguments here. So in both cases, he's, a, he's basically appealing first to God's honor, right? He's saying, if you destroy these, these, uh, these people in the, in the desert, then the, then the nations are going to find out. And what is that going to say about you? You're going to look weak. Argument number one. Number two, you told me that you were er hapayim, you were long-suffering, and you were full of kindness. And you you forgave sin, et cetera. And now you're going to do this? You're going to wipe out your own people? All of them? Except for me? Okay? Slachna le'avon ha'am. This is now verse 19. Slachna le'avon ha'am hazeh ki kodel hazdecha ka'asher nasata le'am hazeh mi mitzrayim ad hena. So now forgive the sin of these people. According to your, the greatness of your, the, the great kindness, or the greatness of your kindness, or the immensity of your kindness, just as you were forgiven this, this people from the time of Egypt, from the time you took them out of Egypt until now. Okay, so Moshe is making a very, very strong argument. I mean, uh, he would make a good Jewish lawyer, as a matter of fact, right? He would uh, be able to, uh, to uh, maybe make, make a, an excellent uh, criminal defense attorney. That's basically what he's acting as here, right? In a certain sense, because he's making these logical arguments, right? But we, this is not the first time, and this is not the last time we see this. Okay, we saw this in the case of Avraham. Okay, Avraham, when he was arguing for the people of Sodom, also made a very similar argument, right? Um, let's find that. That's going to be in Genesis. This poem is thirteen. Quite. Not quite. 15 is pretty going to be dream. 16. Okay, here we go. That's three visits to Abraham, and after that, they go to school. Okay, so Genesis 19. All right. How am I going to remember that in the future? 19 is a prime number. Okay. Okay. So uh, what is the argument that, that Avraham makes to God? Let's find it. I'm going to start something before this to the end of 18. Okay. So Avra makes also appeals to God's, basically calls God a hypocrite in a certain sense. Well, in a, not in a negative way, in a positive way, right? So he says, okay, so first he says, he makes this logical argument. Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked, right? So he's saying, you're going to destroy the city of, of Sodom? What if there are righteous people? And that said, you're going to destroy righteous people along, just because there are wicked people? You're also going to destroy righteous people, right? So he's he's making it an, a, a logical argument, right? And then he says, 
where's that one verse that I'm looking for? Here. So this is Genesis 18, 25. I'll read it in the English, then we can look at the Hebrew for a second. Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you, will not the judge of all the earth do right? Well, that's a horrible English translation. If we look at the Hebrew, so it's Genesis 18, 25. So if we look at the Hebrew, so this is what he says in the Hebrew. Okay. God forbid. Well, you know, God forbid you should do such a thing to kill off a righteous person together with the wicked, to make no distinguish distinction between the righteous and the wicked. God forbid, you know, how, you know, almost like how dare you, you know. It's a sh or it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a <laughs> literally uh it's a uh, it's a it's a disgrace for you to do such a thing and then he says a shofet kol will the judge of the of the of the whole world will the judge of the universe not do justice right he's basically basically calling God a hypocrite right you're the judge of the entire world and you're not going to do justice right he's appealing to God's sense of what's fair and what's right and basically throwing it back in god's face you know uh saying saying you're supposed to be you know you're supposed to be the one who defines justice and now you're going to do this thing which is completely unjust and of course god god listens to him right so there and so avram also would have made an excellent uh, jewish lawyer who he almost made an excellent defense attorney for uh for sodom and gomorrah but in the end they ended up getting the uh the uh I think at the electric chair, I guess they kind of got the firing squad. I don't know. I don't know what they got. <laughs> they got a fire and brimstone. So we'll call that the firing squad, right? But Motion and Avram are, are really act, acting as very uh, clever defense attorneys. Uh, first, in the case of the people of Sodom, and second, here in the case of, of uh, for the people of Israel. And they're making these. Uh, these, uh, these arguments, right? They're appealing to God's sense of fairness, to God's sense of logic. Uh, to God's sense of honor, to his to emotions, they're really hitting hard, right? It's it's really amazing when you think about it, and I, I think the theological implications are are absolutely incredible, right? We see that. I mean, how can you how how can you uh, appeal to God in such a sense, right? How can you change God's mind, or how can you point out to God that He's doing something wrong, and then He says, "Oh, right, I'm doing something wrong. Uh, I'm I won't do it after all." So does that mean you know God is wrong? How can God? be wrong how can god be flawed how can god change his mind these are all you know uh long theological slash philosophical arguments which are, are way out of the scope of this except to say that that uh, i will say that i think that that the god that is really 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 uh misunderstood he is not you know some distant uh uh infallible uh god i mean he is all of that but at the same time, he's, he's very emotional. He's very closely connected to his people. Uh, he's he's uh, very open to listen to his people. And uh, he's whether he's doing this as a test for Moshe or not, again, that's kind of a philosophical argument, or both at the same time. God can do multiple contradictory things at the same time, just like, uh, uh, just like uh, free will and determinism can coexist in the world of God. Uh, from God's point of view, and there doesn't have to be a contradiction. At any rate, these are long theological, philosophical arguments. But the, the main point is that that uh, that 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 Moshe is able to use these, uh, shall we say, appealing to God's honor, appealing to God's sense of fairness, throwing God's own words back in his face, and is able to to use these very very uh, uh, strong techniques. Right? Again, I, I I compare it to a to a defense lawyer, to a very talented Jewish defense lawyer defending the people of Israel and is able to successfully do so and and uh, and, and convince God or make God see the light, right? So uh, it's it's really interesting, fascinating stuff. Okay. And Yahweh responds, we're in verse 20. So Yahweh says, I have forgiven according to your words, right? So God, see, the God likes Moshe's argument, okay? I would say not that God is, uh, per se, changing his mind. I would say more like 
I guess you could say it's a test for Moshe, but more like this is God's intention, and Moshe is able to kind of uh, make an argument that God likes, and God responds to it. Maybe that kind of describes it, although, of course, it's more complicated than that. Okay, verse 21. Olam hai ani. Okay. <laughs> Lo yiruha. Okay, yiruha. Yiruha. Sorry. Okay, so God says, okay, I'm not gonna, I, I'm gonna forgive them, but they're not getting off scot free. Okay, uh, verse 22, Kikola Anashim Haroim et Kivodi, because all of these people who saw my glory and saw my signs, which I did in Egypt and in the desert, in a suoti eser pamim, and who have tested me these 10 times. Of course, we don't have an account of 10 times, right? There aren't actual 10 times. Eser Pamim is kind of a phrase, right? Like, I'll be back in five minutes. It doesn't literally mean five minutes, okay? Test me all of these times. Eser is 7, 10, 40, 70. These are all numbers that appear in the Tanakh, and they, they kind of represent, uh, I guess you would say, round numbers or ideas, right? So we've tested me these 10 times. We certainly don't have 10 times that the Israelites have tested uh, God. And did not and did not listen to my voice. Uh, uh, um, so basically, what he's saying is very hard to translate word for word the Hebrew here. But the idea is that there is no way. Okay, so they they are not going to be seeing. There's no way I'm going to let them see the land that I promised. Okay, minaets, minaets means those who refuse or those who, who uh, let's see how they translate it here, reject, okay, minaetsai lo yirauha, okay, those who reject me are not going to see it, okay, so that's the punishment, okay, they're going to live, but they're not going into the land, okay, verse 24, avdi kalev, kalev, ekev, haitha, ruach, acheret, haimo, uyemale, Okay, so um, my servant Kalev, Kalev ben Yifuna, because he had a different spirit, okay, within him, and he 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 went after me or fulfilled, you know, he uh, fulfilled his obligation to me. One could say, I will bring him to the the, uh, the land which which uh, and there his inheritance shall inherit the land. So this punishment that all the children of Israel are going to get that they're not going to see the land, they're not going to enter the land, and in fact they don't. Okay, they all die off in the desert. Is the only exceptions to this are going to be Kaleb ben Yefune and Yoshua ben Nun. Yoshua ben Nun is going to lead the people into the land of Israel. That's what the Book of Joshua speaks about. And uh, Kaleb ben Yifuna is not going to die in the desert. Okay, the Amalekki, the Ani Yosheb Aimek, Mahar, Pinu, Su'u Lachem Hamidbar Derech Yam Suf. Okay, I'm sorry, the Amalekki, the Ani Yosheb Aimek, Mahar, Pinu, Su'u Lachem Hamidbar Derech Yam Suf. So now you're going to basically, because the Amalekites and the Canaanites are sitting in in the uh, in the valley. Tomorrow you're gonna you're gonna turn around you're gonna and you're gonna travel towards the Sea of Reeds towards the Red Sea. Okay, so basically, okay, we're gonna turn around. We're I was gonna take you up into the land right now. No, that's not happening. We're turning around, and now uh, you're gonna wander in the desert for forty years. Right. So this is where the punishment for wandering in the desert for forty years uh, comes from. Okay. All right. Any comments? Any questions that anyone would like to ask or say? No. So just to point out one thing. Let's 
just want to see one thing. So here, just regarding Kalev, I'll just read this very quickly. This is from the Wikipedia article. Kalev, the spy, is the son of Yifuna. Yifuna is called the Knezite. Okay, Numbers 32, Joshua 14. The Knezites are listed as one of the nations associated with the land of Canaan at the time that God made a covenant with Abraham. <laughs> However, Kalev is mentioned alongside the descendants of Judah, recorded in 1 Chronicles 4. I'm sorry, it's not 1 Chronicles 31. It's 1 Chronicles 4, because chapter 4, verse 1. <coughs> no. 4.15, okay. And the sons of Caleb ben Yefuna, et cetera, et cetera, and the sons of uh, Elah, Kenaz. Uh, so Numbers 13.6, likewise, lists Caleb as a tribal leader in Judah. Contrarily, the Kenizites are also generally associated with Kenaz, son of Esau, making the Edomite, making them an Edomite clan. So basically, uh, to make a long story short, uh, this paragraph here is pointing out the fact that although Caleb is called the Knezite. He's also listed among the descendants of Judah, and that's in 1 Chronicles 4. If we have time, I'd go into that right now. And he's also listed as a tribal leader in Judah, so therefore, uh, perhaps he's not a Knezite. Again, Caleb's, uh, it's a Caleb uh, and Yefuna, Ben Kanaz. Caleb's grandfather is named Kanaz. So it just might mean from the, from the Kanaz clan, clan of the tribe of Judah of the people of Israel. Okay. So now here <coughs> in Joshua 14, we see that Kalev is given Hebron. Okay. So Kalev, so this is really what you might call karma or what the rabbis might call Mida Keneged Mida, right? So where did the, the spies spy out the land? They spied out, they went to Hebron, right? Let me close this out. Right? Hebron is really the only place that's mentioned by name. Other areas are mentioned, but the only city that's mentioned by name is Hebron. Where was it? It was back in 13. Right? So verse 22. So chapter 13, verse 22. Vialuba Negev. So they, they went up through the Negev. Yavo at Hebron. And they came to Hebron. Sham Achiman, there they saw the giants, right? Uh, and then again, we said this uh, this verse is a is a is a hagigaz party time for uh, biblical archaeologists. At any rate, uh, so that's where they spied out, right? That's the place that's that's really the only place, as far as I can see, that besides the Negev, but that's really more of a region than a specific place. The only place that's mentioned by name is Hebron, okay? And we see in Joshua fourteen. That for a second, that Hebron is given to Caleb, right? Again, just to make things go quickly, we'll look in the in the English. Okay, now the people of Judah approached Joshua at Gilgal. Gilgal is, is the first place they stopped on the uh, on the Israelite side. We've actually visited Gilgal with our good friend Bruce or what they believe might be Gilgal. And Kala, the son of Yifuna, the Kinezite, said to him, You know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, Kadesh Barnea, about you and me? I was 40 years old when Moses, Moses, Moses the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea <coughs> to explore the land. So here it's called not Kadesh, it's called Kadesh Barnea. I should add that also. So this is Joshua 14, 6. Let me just add this. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh, Kadesh Barnea to explore the land, and I brought him back a report according to my convictions. But my fellow Israelites, 
went up with me, made the hearts of the people melt in fear. I, however, followed the Lord, my God, wholeheartedly. So on that day, Moses swore to me, the land on which your feet have walked will be your inheritance and that of your children forever, because you have followed the Lord, my God, wholeheartedly. Now then, just as the Lord promised, he has kept me alive for 45 years since the time he said this to Moses, while Israel moved about in the wilderness. So here I am today, 85 years old, which means that... Uh, that that uh, uh, Yeshua was 40 years old at the time he explored, explored the land. Okay, also notice the round number 40. We mentioned that is one of the numbers that recurs a lot in the uh, in the Tanakh, right? 7, 10, uh, 40, 70. These are all numbers that you'll see a lot. I am still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I am just as vigorous to go out for battles. Now give me this hill country that the Lord promised me that day. You yourself heard then that the Anakites were there, okay, that the giants were there, and their cities were large and fortified, but the Lord helping me, I will drive them out, just as he said. Then Joshua blessed Caleb, the son of Yefuna, and gave him Hebron as his inheritance. So Hebron has belonged to Caleb, son of Yefuna, the Kenizzite, ever since, because he followed the Lord, the God of Israel, wholeheartedly. Hebron used to be called Kiryat Arba, after Arba, who's the greatest man among the Anakites. So there we have it. So Caleb and Yefuna, who explored Hebron is given Hebron, right? He and Joshua are the only two that uh, stay alive until the Israelites enter into the land of Israel. And he's given Hebron. Okay. So, where were we? We're in 14. Okay. Okay, verse 26. Basically, what God is saying is, you know, how much longer am I going to put up with these people who are constantly complaining to me? Okay? Verse 28. Emor. So now God is going to give the punishment, right? He said, all those who, who uh, you know, I will make sure they will, you know, by, they, there's, you know, by my, you know, by my name, they will not see the land, okay? So just as they spoke, okay? So in this desert, so just as they said, it's better that we die in the desert, right? We saw that in, where was it? Okay. Right here. Okay. Verse 2. Uh, so all of the children of Israel complained or, you know, uh, uh, yeah, complained, I'm trying to think of a stronger word, you know, rioted against, you know, complained, that's the way it's usually translated as, well, go with complained, uh, and they said, and they said to them, to, to Moses and Aaron, call it Eda, all of the congregation said, Better that we had died in the land of Egypt, or the Midbar, or in the desert, in this desert. Okay, it is better that we had died. So God says, "Okay, you you said it. Now you get it. Okay, you're going to die in the desert. Okay, that's exactly what he's saying here. So he's responding to 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 uh, to uh, Numbers fourteen two. Okay, and he says again in verse 28, Amor Elehem, say to them, Hi Ani Neum Yahweh, as I live, right? And that's a swear, that's Yahweh making a swear in his own name. So as I live by my name, right? As I Yahweh live, usually say Hi Yahweh. That's the way you take a swear. That's the way you make an oath in, in Tanakh Hebrew. Here he says, Hi Ani. So he's taking a swear in his own eternal name, right? 
<laughs> so even God is swearing in his own name, right? That's This is an oath in the name of Yahweh. That that imlok as less let lest that which you uh, which you said in my ears uh, should not be done to you. In other words, exactly what you said, that's what's going to happen to you. You said you you want to die in the desert, you're going to die in the desert. Okay, but midbar yiprufigrechem in this desert, your uh, corpses will fall. Okay, and the word figrechem. Uh, Okay, <clears throat> a peger is a is kind of a almost like a, a vile word for corpse. Here, corpse a carcass, right? Peger, right? So your corpses, you know, it's not even saying you 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 know you die. See, in an almost like a crass way, your corpses will fall in this desert. And all of your pikudechem again is is pikudechem is referring to the census. Okay, all of your numbers, again, all of your numbers. Let's see how we would translate this. All of your your uh, minions, maybe. Okay, here they translate you who were numbered. That's the way the NIV translated. All of you who were numbered according to all of your numbers, me ben Aslim Shanaf from 20 years old, old and and up. Asher Halino Tim Alai, which who complained to me. Verse 30. Okay. Uh, you will not see. It's, it's very hard to translate from the from the Hebrew because literally what it means, literally, literally the way it's done in Hebrew is um, it's stated in a positive sense. Okay, as I live, lest or you, if you see. Okay, or in other words, the only way to really translate it to English is you will not see, but that's not the sense of what the Hebrew is saying. Okay, maybe lest you see, okay, as I live, lest you see the land, okay, or lest or 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 lest I let you see the land, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. It's kind of a it's usually translated uh in the negative, okay. I will not let you or this, but really in the Hebrew, it's it's much more. Subtle than that. I'd have to try to think to get a good translation for it. But here it says, if you <coughs> will go to the land, okay, lest you go to the land, uh, which I raised my hand, the to the saying that I will I will I will cause you to dwell in it, aside from Yafuna and Yeshua ben Nun. Okay. In other words, God is swearing that nobody is going to see that land aside from Kalab bin Yafuna and Yeshua ben Nun. Verse 31. Okay, but your children, who you said are going to be labaz, who you said are going to be uh, um, taken as spoils. Okay, where was that? We saw that also right up above here, right here, in verse three. Nashenu v'tapenu iu labaz. Okay, our women and our children. Will uh, be taken as spoils. Okay. Nashenu v'tapenu yu labaz. Okay. So that's they said we're better we died in the desert. Why are you bringing us into this land that our that our our women and children should be taken as slaves or as, as spoils, right? And so now God is saying your your children who you said were going to be taken as spoils, they're the ones who are going to live in the land. So God is really you know sticking it to him. You don't want to mess with God. When he gets you, he knows exactly how to get you. Okay. So, uh, so verse thirty-one. So your children, your little ones, who you said will be taken as spoils, uh, or will be taken as spoils. That I will, I will uh, bring them in, and they will know the land that you have rejected, that you have you have grown weary of, that you have grown sick and tired of. Okay. And your corpses will fall in this desert. Will 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 uh, you'll die in this desert? Okay. And your children, they will be roim, basically like wandering around like sheep. Okay. They will be. Uh, they will wander. In this desert, Let's see how they translate it here. The NIV shall be shepherds. Okay, you are in the midbar. Okay, 
Okay, interesting. I don't know how I would also do this with that one. I don't think I would translate it that way. 33. Will be herdsmen. Okay. So they will be shepherds in the desert. I think more like wandering around like sheep. Although, yes, Roa is a shepherd. But maybe also in this case, because it's the pa'al form, the simple form, maybe it doesn't mean someone who shepherds someone else, but maybe it means being shepherd or wandering around like sheep. I think that's the way I would translate it. I'm curious to see if other translations pick up on that. <coughs> So we overshot the landing pad here. Numbers 13, no, we're numbers 14. That's 14, 14, This guy also, Everett Fox, is pretty darn good. Let's see what he says. Yeah. Your children shall graze in the wilderness for 40 years. So he, he translates it the way I would translate it. Not that they will be shepherds. They will graze in the wilderness. They will wander around like sheep in the wilderness for 40 years. That makes much more sense from the context. And again, the verb ra'ah with an ayin, okay? Yes, ara'ah is a shepherd. But again, because it's the pa'a form, the most simple form of the verb, it can also be intransitive, meaning it might not mean to shepherd sheep. It might, it might mean to graze like sheep. To shepherd oneself, one could say, in a certain sense. Okay, so I would translate it. I would agree with uh, with Everett Fox's translation, not Robert Alter's translation, not the NIV translation. Okay, so I would translate this as Menechem Yu Ra'im Your your uh, your children will wander around like sheep in the desert for forty years. Again, here we have the forty. Right, we saw Kala Ben Yifuna was forty. Right, uh, when uh, when uh, God's when uh, he was given the promise by God through Moshe, and they will bear the, the guilt or they will bear the burden of your, is your whoring, okay? But it means, in this case, it means basically, uh, you know, znut means kind of a turning away or, or prostituting oneself to other gods or to other philosophies, right? It's often used not in connection with, uh, or by extension, not in connection with uh, with sexual promiscuity, like literally prostituting oneself, but it means it means by extension prostituting oneself to another god or prostituting oneself away from God, basically rejecting God. Until the until the last of your your uh, your corpses square brackets fall in the desert. Okay, and now God goes on with the as my friend who speaks Yiddish would say the the shtech, you know, really sticking it to the the uh I don't speak a lot of Yiddish. <coughs> but uh my father understands Yiddish, my mother understands Yiddish, my grandparents all understood Yiddish, but I don't understand the damn thing. And quite frankly, I really don't want to. At any rate, the Mispari Amima shared according to the number of days which you toured out, which you scouted out the land, so according to the number of days, you spied out the land for 40 days, now you're going to get 40 years, okay, one year per day, okay, and so you'll know, uh, so this rejection, I want to see this word. Ah, not a very common word. Second. Okay. Okay, got it. I just want to see the, the etymology of that word. Okay, dokie. Okay. So that is uh, that. Ani Yahweh dibati im lo zot ase lechol ha'eda ha'ra'ah zot ha'noadim alai ba midbar aze 
tamu v'sham yamutu. Okay, so God is basically summarizing there. I'm God, and this is what's going to happen to you guys. And now the ten spies brought a bad report. They are going to get a worse punishment. Verse 36. Wanashim asher shalach Moshe latur et ha'aretz wa yashuvu wa yalinu alau et kol ha'eda dotzi diba al ha'aretz. So all of the other spies who had brought back a bad report about the land. We yamuto anashim they they were put to death or they died in a plague but only among those 12 spies were the only two that lived verse 39 so Moshe now tells the nation what their punishment is that they're going to be wandering in the desert for 40 days that they're for four years that their corpses are going to die in the desert are going to fall in the desert and that their children, who they said would not would uh, would uh, would be taken as hostages, taken as as uh, as spoils, they're the ones who are going to go into the land. All the stuff that God said to Moshe, now Moshe tells to the nation, and uh, the nation is uh, uh, the nation uh, mourns. Okay, okay. So now the nation is trying to make up for it, but as they say, timing is everything. Or as uh, the joke my friend used to say, um, what's the most important thing in the joke timing? You get it, you get it. So now the Israelites decide, okay, we're gonna, now we're gonna take matters into our own hand. We see that that never goes well. <clears throat> we saw that in the case of, of uh, of uh, Nadav and Avihu, two eldest sons of Aharon, when they decided to take matters in their own hand and bring uh, incense, and we're going to see it here. So they react. I mean, there's such psychology here. I'm trying to think of maybe a good analogy. I don't know. I can't think of anything right now. Okay, you you piss someone off, and then you then it's not the right time to apologize because they're still mad. And you go like groveling back to them, and it only makes matters worse. That's kind of what's going on here. Okay, so they they angered God, they pissed them off real bad. He punished them, and now at the wrong time in the wrong place, they're going to try to grovel to God and show him, no, 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 we 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 uh, we really are going to listen to you. No, it's too late. The game is already over, and it's only going to make matters worse. And that's exactly what happens here. So, verse 40, we ask him about the alu el rosh hahar lemor. He nenu we alinu. He nenu we alinu el amakom asher amar yahweh ki hatanu. said, here we are. We're going to go. We're going to enter the land. Okay, we realize we did wrong. Let's. We're going to enter the land on our own. Yomer moshe lama ze atem ovrim al pi yahweh o hi lo tislaf. Why are you, why are you violating the word of God? It's not going to be successful. It's not going to go well for you. Okay, verse forty-two. Al ta'alu ki en Yahweh bekir b'chem velot velot tinachfu lifnei ayvechem. Don't go up into the hill country. Right, they're going to go attack the Amalekites. Okay, don't um, go up into the hill country. God is not with you. Okay, and you're going to and tinachfu lifnei ayvechem. You're going to nagef. You're going to you're going to you're going to be destroyed, or you're going to be a negaf is again a plague. It's the same thing, same word we saw up above. Magifa. Here we have tinavfu. It's exactly the same root. So you'll be plagued. You'll be killed in a plague by your enemies. I guess would be a way to translate it. Verse forty-three. Ki amalakiva kanai sham lifnechem. Because there are the Amalekites and the Canaanites before you. <laughs> the Canaanites and the Amalekites are there, and you're gonna fall by the sword because because uh, you uh, because you you went away from God and He's not with you. Verse forty four.
יעפילו לעלות אל ראש ההר וארון פריט יחווה ומשה לא משהו בקרב המחנה So what is this word? Yeah, filu. Yeah, it's related to ofalim. Okay, I thought so. Okay. Let's find. Yeah, it's a tumor in the vulva or anus, so basically a hemorrhoid. And we do have the word ophalim, which in the Cree is replaced with the hoes. Let me just see something here, just out of my own curiosity. I don't even know how to spell hemorrhoids. Oh, hemorrhoids. <laughs> hemorrhoids, not hemorrhoids. Hemorrhoids, there we go. Hemorrhoids. Uh, not a word I need to spell. So let's take it back here. Okay, Krif Ktiv of Falim. Keep running twenty twenty seven. <coughs> So here it is in Deuteronomy 2827, the boils of Egypt. So this is the curse at the end of Deuteronomy, if you disobey the Torah, which is then replaced with the so the the ktiv, the written text says Ofalim. Trying to get a scratch off the screen, which is not a scratch, it's part of the website. But Ofalim which is, uh, so they translated it as tumors, and that's replaced in the Cree with Tehorim, okay? So, Ophalim is hemorrhoids, tumors. That's related to this word right here. Oops. Ya'apilum, yeah, right? You see here, ofalim, ayin, pe, lamen. This is translated as, according to the Strong's, fal, up, mm -hmm. swell. Let's look at Robert Alter, how he translates that. Why is it you're overstepping the Lord's word? So he translates Ya'apilu, Ya'apilu with an ayin as overstepping. Is that 44? No. This one. They strove to go up to the mountaintop. So he translates it, I'm sorry, as strove. Okay, he has a comment on that. Let's see if he points out the connection with the tumors. Strove. The Hebrew verb ya'apilu is unique to this verse and its meaning is in dispute. One common etymology links it with ofel, height, assuming that it means something like strive upwards. Okay. So what we saw does not link it with ofel, I don't think. Although maybe it's the same thing. It, it links it with afal, swell. 
which is related to Ophalim that we saw in Deuteronomy 28, 24, was it? Which is a tumor, a swelling, right? So strive. Okay, strive. Okay, height. Why do you know? Okay, strive upward. Uh, Everett Fox translates this as, so this is verse 44. See how he deals with it. They went up recklessly to the top of the hill country. Okay, interesting. So they went up to the, into, they wanted to go up to the, into the top of the hill or into the hill country. Uh, but the Ark of the Covenant and Moshe did not leave the camp. Okay, so then the Amalekites and the Canaanites uh, who lived in that hilly area, in that hill country, that's not a particular hill. That's a hill country. Second here. Okay, so he does translate as that particular mountain, but I think it really means in that mountainous area. Uh, they came down, yakum, yakum. So yakum is to is to strike them, and yakum, katit is is uh, um, is smashed or shattered, as Robert Alter translates it as. You can have you can have shemen, katit. Shemen katit means crushed. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, Shemen zayit katit. Shemen it means crushed olive oil. So that's the same word here. Yaktum. And there we go. Katat to beat by crushing. Okay, and you have the word katit. Oh, they missed it here. At any rate, that's what it's related to. So you definitely see there's a little bit of poetry here. Yaktum vi yakum vi yaktum. Okay. Struck them and crushed them. Ad Harma and Arma is a uh, place name, but as Robert Alter points out, it, here I'll just read his comment. Maybe a place name, though its location is unknown, or it could be common noun destruction, in which case the sense of the phrase would be until they were utterly destroyed. Okay, so that's chapter 14. Now we have chapter 15. Let me try to read through chapter 15 quickly because I want to end the study. It's getting late. Okay. So we're in, now we get back to laws about sacrifices. This is important stuff. Okay. So I'll just try to read through it without with as little commentary as possible, so that way we can get through the Parsha. I'm just going to turn on the light here. Excuse me for one second. Okie dokie. So, why <laughs>
Oyayin Lenesech. Just one second here. Just want to see if he's any, any commentary about why all of a sudden we're getting back to sacrifices. So Robert Alter says, I don't want to re rely on Robert Alter too much, but he's convenient and I like his commentary overall. I don't agree with everything he says, but it's a good starting point often. After the incident of the spies, the narrative <laughs> movement is broken off oh, oh, by the insertion of a miscellany of, miscellany of laws pertaining to the cult, the Sabbath, and mnemonic ritual fringes. The narrative of wilderness rebellions will resume in the next chapter with the story of Korach's mutiny. It is not clear why the redactors deemed it appropriate to introduce this legal miscellany here, though the best effort of explanation has been made by Avraham Ibn Ezra, who I like very much, with his characteristic alertness to possibilities of continuity in disjunct texts. This section was juxtaposed to the previous because they, the ten scouts, and their followers had been cut down, and people were mourning to comfort the sons by letting them know that they would come to the land. Ibn Ezra goes on to say that the emphasis here is on forgiveness. Verse 25 is also responsive to the sin of the ten scouts and their followers in a reference to a high hand. Verse 30 looks back to their arrogance trying to storm the Canaanite heights without divine authorization. Okay. Could be. Okay. Min hasolet iseron balul berevi'i tahin shaman. Verse 5. Yayin lenesek revi'i tahin ta'ase al so this is all speaking about wine libations and uh so basically grain and wine that you bring with with offerings Sorry, verse six. Verse seven. Verse eight. She's on the table. Again, this is speaking about other types of offerings and the grain and wine libation that's brought with them. Verse 10. Okay. Verse 11. O la ail ha ehad, O la se, Bikfasim, O la aizim, Kamispar, Asher, Tasu, Kaha, Tasu, le had, Misparam, Kol ha Israh, ya se Kaha, et ele, Nakriv, Ishe, Area, Niho, le Yahweh. So now it's talking about the Israh, the native born, and how here we have a ger. So here the gear is listed differently, okay? So now it's saying the gear is equivalent to the to the native born Israelite, but again, the context here is in the laws of the grain and wine libations. Anyone who says that this is a general statement that the ger is 100% equal to the Ezrach is uh, distorting the Torah either purposely or by accident. Torah had mishpat had So again, you could say that this is a general statement, but Torah. Does not mean the entire Torah. Torah means set of instructions, and we've just dealt with a set of instructions, which is the the grain and wine uh, libations 
to be brought for sacrifices. Although you could perhaps make a claim that because it's repeated a number of times, that this is extended to a general statement, but I don't think that's the case here. Okay, we're in verse 17. Twenty-two. <laughs> So this is if you fail to do a commandment and you bring a certain type of sacrifice. Verse 25. He, by accident, is by accident, he, Bishraga, <laughs> And again, we have this phrase, Torah lechem. So it's not a general statement here. It's clear that when it says, Torah lechem, one Torah shall be for you, that it's speaking about a certain set of laws. And here we have it explicitly, So whenever you see this phrase, there's one Torah for, for the Ezrach, or for the children of Israel, or for the Ezrach, and the ger that lives among you, that dwells among you, it's speaking about for a specific set of laws, whether it's in Exodus 12, speaking about the gear who wants to bring the the uh, uh, the Passover sacrifice, whether it's up above, speaking about the wine, the uh, grain and wine libations, grain offering and wine libations, or whether it's here speaking about the sacrifice that's brought for unintentional violation of the mitzvah, right? We see this phrase, Torah, I'm sorry. Okay, that same phrase, it's always speaking about a specific set of laws. It's not a general statement that the Ger and the Ezrach are uh, considered exactly equal for all the laws of the Torah. And we have examples where the Ger is, uh, there are specific laws uh, for the Ger. For instance, you can charge them repeat, you can charge them interest, you can uh, sell uh, Nivela. An animal, okay, and of course the rabbis say that that's a ger toshav, not a ger tzedek. I'm not going to get into all of that now. It's a very long and complicated subject, but I don't believe that that's the case. Okay. Wahanefesh asher ta'ase biyad rama min ha'ezrach min hager et Yahweh hu mi adef unichrata hanefesh ahi mekarev rama. Verse thirty-one. Ki devar Yahweh baza wa'et mis wato. Ifar ki karet ti karet hanef shahi on sins against God. Now, example, the other 
gatherings, gathering on Shabbat. That's work. Not on light. Yeah. So he's brought outside of the camp and stoned to death for doing real work on Shabbat. And finally, we have anyone who is, who is a rabbinical Jew and says Shema every day knows this. This is part of the three paragraphs that are considered part of the Shema recital twice a day. <coughs> okay. 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 This is the the blue thread. Here we have. And quickly, because my battery's about to go dead, and I don't feel like running and getting a charger. Typical kind of summary sentence. I am the Lord your God who took you out of Egypt. And this is probably a summary sentence for all of these laws. Okay, not just this paragraph, although most rabbinical Jews would think it's just a summary law either for the Shema or for this particular paragraph. So with that said, we've come to the end of the Parsha, numbers 13 through 15, Parsha, uh, <laughs> Shalach, and we have Shalach Nu Et Shalach. We have sent the Parsha of sending, we've sent it on its way. So with that, I will end the study because my battery is about to go dead. I thank you all for joining me. I wish you all a uh, Shabbat Shalom and a Shabbat Tov and the Israt Yahweh. We'll see you again next week. This is Chacham Melech Ben Yaakov of Karai Insights and the World Alliance of Karaim signing off.